Okay, our speaker today is uh, our own Sergei Gukov. Uh, so Sergei is a professor of uh, physics and mathematics here uh, since uh, 2005. And he got his uh, um, bachelor's degree in the Moscow uh, Institute of Physics and Technology, a renowned place, uh, in 97. And then he uh, got his PhD from Princeton. Uh, his advisor was, advisor was Edward Witten. Uh, I actually met Sergei about that time. So we met him first at the summer school in Karges. That's um, during the time when NATO still had no more serious business than funding uh, summer schools on theoretical physics. So now they have other fish to fry. Uh, so and um, so he sorry he came here to Caltech. He was a clay fellow. Uh, after he got his PhD and uh, came to Caltech. He, uh, after a brief stint in Santa Barbara, he returned to Caltech and been here uh, uh, since 2007. Uh, and uh, uh, he's uh, also a visiting chair uh, uh, at uh, ICDP, uh, Mariam Merzakani visiting chair, and also um, um, uh, uh, MacArthur Professor of Theoretical Physics and Mathematics. And today he's going to tell us about uh, machine learning and knots. And thank you for making the title so simple. Well, thank you. Thank you, Anton, for the kind introduction. Right, so um, what I'm going to tell you about is a rather interesting story, and uh, it's uh, part of what I do. I have to say that most of what I do is uh, quite mathematical and very abstract, so uh, I figured over the course of the years that such topics are extremely efficient at putting the audience to sleep, uh, with one exception. So this uh, talk is sort of exception because it will involve mathematics, but mathematics will be uh, very visual, and um, it's about shapes, so that's uh, perhaps what makes it easier uh, to, to, to relate. And it also will involve machine learning and AI, and because computers are now everywhere, and AI is uh, revolutionizing many domains of our life and science, that's also perhaps what makes uh, this particular topic uh, relatable. I have to say that uh, Five years ago, when I started uh, thinking about it, um, mostly motivated by popular media and uh, various other revolutions that AI made in other domains, uh, I didn't know much about machine learning. I didn't know Python, Haskell, or any other cool stuff. And um, I was just curious whether machine learning can help in theoretical domains. So of course, AI helps a lot with uh, data-intensive branches of even fundamental science. Uh, it's been used quite heavily in experimental physics, where we have a lot of data. It's been used in observational cosmology, other domains. But my question was, what about something very theoretical, very mathematical, where uh, usual logical arguments are not so long? We even talk about back-of-the-envelope calculations, or ideas are, in some sense, more important. Can it really be helpful? Uh, in uh, theoretical and mathematical areas. So that was the question I was uh, trying to ask back then, and I have to admit, I was very skeptical. I, I, I thought that I'll invest some time to prove to myself that, uh, yes, I don't need to learn more about it. So, uh, of course, uh, um, I proved myself to, to be wrong on that part. So uh, I'll try to tell you two stories, one which is involves rather fundamental problems of completely theoretical mathematical nature that uh, for instance, describe braiding of anions, so that's uh, one connection for incarnation in theoretical physics. And on the other side of the spectrum, it will be another story about uh, language processing in, in machine learning. I'll try to make uh, this talk since I'm uh, re fairly recent to the subject, so I remember what it, how it feels not, not knowing many of the AI concepts myself, so I'll try to make it very accessible. So if you didn't have any experience with machine learning, um, hopefully, I'll, I'll pitch it at the right level so that you, you feel comfortable. So it can be basically introduction um, through particular class of problems that we'll try to approach. But I also hope that even experts, some of you uh, either here or on Zoom, who worked with um, various uh, machine learning applications uh, and know a lot, will also benefit in one way or another because uh, especially toward the end of the talk, uh, we'll discuss various interesting architectures, so there'll be hopefully something to learn, uh, and um, if anything, hopefully it'll be just uh, entertaining. 
So, um, while I'm describing uh, this uh, kind of uh, my motivation and how I got onto this, um, uh, many of you probably already uh, read this uh, on on the first slide. So this is uh, a conversation which happened between um, a human and, and a computer back in 1971. It was one of the early AI systems that uh, learned how to talk. And as you can see, the conversation is pretty meaningful. So a person is asking questions uh, whether one pyramid can support another, and the computer is answering. Actually, it's within certain uh, framework of concepts, but it's, it's a very meaningful conversation, uh, not, not, not so bad at all. And uh, this was, let's see. Some reason that the slide, but try clicking on the slide first. Uh -huh. Okay, I advanced it at least this way. We'll try to. Okay, now it works. Yeah, thank you so much. So this is the creator of that uh, early AI system. Uh, this this uh, AI system has a very intriguing name. I'll let you figure out what this stands for or how it got here. Um, and the name of uh, this person is Terry Winograd. So he is one of the founding fathers of the subject of natural language processing and natural language understanding. So he's known for various books that he's written. Uh, and uh, this uh, Trudel uh, AI system was one of his early babies devised back at the time at MIT. So since then, he moved to Stanford and um, had many other uh, successes, in particular many good students. So one of his students, uh, shown here on the slide, you know him very well. So he is probably best known for uh, so-called PageRank and also became a co-founder of a company that in 2015 uh, famously managed to beat the, uh, the best Go player in the world. And um, throughout the talk, I'll give you actually many timelines. So uh, if you carefully follow various dates that I'm going to mention, you can probably see why I got interested in the subject five years ago, and also why now is an exciting time to even think about this bridge between machine learning and theoretical and mathematical disciplines. So think about this as a sort of version of the question that cosmologists ask a lot, why now? So I'll, I'll try to, through these dates, explain why now is, is a good time. Anyway, so going back to this, <coughs> um, Google uh, had uh, AlphaGo, of course, in 2015, uh, but uh, let's wait till, till we get there, so uh, we'll start slowly. And coming back to the question whether it can help in fundamental sciences and mathematical and theoretical disciplines, well, I want to uh, quote our own uh, Richard Feynman, who actually compared our research process to playing the game of chess where we don't actually know the rules of the game, but what we're allowed is to see how pieces move on the board, and from this we are supposed to figure out what the rules are. So this process is actually very accurate and perfect fit for today's talk, because not only it describes how we do research in theoretical physics and mathematics, but uh, also how machines learn. So they observe lots and lots of rounds of games of different types, and from mistakes, from wins and failures, they, they learn. And that's actually exactly how, how we do science in the first place. So uh, it doesn't, therefore, sound too, too distant. So speaking of the game of chess, um, this is uh, one of the chess grandmasters, Gary Kasparov. In fact, I was lucky enough to meet him. So when I was in middle school, I went to a chess school that, that he organized that was in the late 80s. And um, one of the things that, that surprised me is that even back then, when computers, it was 80s, and uh, computers were still not quite popular among uh, middle school or high school kids uh, in, in classroom, he actually had several classrooms where not only we played chess against uh, each other, uh, our partners, but where we could uh, try different programs playing uh, chess with, with a computer. So here you can see uh, Gary in uh, early 90s, and I can vouch that, yes, that's pretty much how it looked, and that's a typical photo from our classroom. It surprised me back then that even though 
uh, we were supposed to learn various uh, strategies and tactics uh, in, in chessboards, he was very open to computers. So maybe that was one of the reasons why he agreed to play against um, uh, Deep Blue of IBM a couple of years later. So this is a photo from 1996, the first match where compared to the previous slide, you can see that uh, he's not smiling anymore. That <laughs> looks much, much more serious. So he won this one, but uh, a year later he, he lost uh, to uh, Deep Blue in this uh, 1997 rematch. And since then, computers basically took off. And uh, I told you already about AlphaGo and other things. <clears throat> so it's uh, another uh, anecdotal kind of story that uh, IBM uh, devised uh, Deep Blue in part to kind of popularize computers and to connect it to, to, to general public and uh, do something a little bit more relatable. And uh, some people who were involved in building uh, Deep Blue uh, actually worked on speech processing. So there was an entire group in um, IBM and um, uh, one of the uh, people who is actually responsible for the name Deep Blue, originally it was uh, called something else, uh, was uh, uh, Peter Brown. So he worked at this uh, group on uh, speech processing at IBM until 1993, got involved into this project. And then in 1993, uh, Jim Simons lured him into Renaissance Technologies, where he remains up to present day and in fact remains uh, a, a CEO of Renaissance Technologies and probably one of the longest employees in the company. But anyway, coming back to, to this story, you might be wondering uh, what speech processing group at IBM had to do with the game of chess. And that's a very good question, so that's a kind of question to which um, I'll try to, to give an answer today. So moving on and thinking a little bit about this Feynman's quote and how we learn and how machines learn. Well, again, we see many chess boards or many boards or uh, whatever game we're playing. And from experiences, we are trying to um, learn um, either the rules or strategies, uh, <clears throat> whatever the goal is. And of course, there is a huge difference between trained and untrained chess master. And there is a huge difference between trained and untrained neural net. Uh, well, after we see many, many combinations on boards, it becomes an automated process. So this is a sort of 10,000 uh, hour rule popularized by Malcolm Gladwell who says that if you invest a sufficient amount of time on a certain subject, you become an expert. And in the case of chess, for instance, if you look at this board, you immediately see a big picture. You don't just see random pieces. You see how we got there, what's the position of power, uh, is one side about to lose or win. You immediately see the whole rich story behind it. And this is precisely how AI systems learn. They, um, see many, many repetitions of the same thing. They get rewarded and punished. And in exactly the same way, they become familiar with important details. They can quickly filter what's important, what's not important. So that's, that's the rough uh, picture. So today I'll invite you to play a very simple game. Again, I chose particular kind of game because it's easy to visualize, easy to explain, which has to do with braiding or uh, also not theory. So, uh, basically, I invite you to play a game where uh, by looking at the picture of this uh, loop string called a knot, we have to tell whether it's knotted or unknotted. So in other words, whether by uh, moving um, this piece of the pieces of the strand without cutting them, we can reduce the diagram to a simple circle like this. So that's, that's basically the question. So it's a decision problem. It's a yes or no question. And it looks very simple, so that's, that's the game that we'll start playing, and there are many variants I'll mention to you uh, in a bit. Um, but maybe first, uh, can I see a show of hands who thinks that this diagram is non-trivially knotted? How about who thinks it's unknotted? Okay, some opinions are split, very good. This is a slightly more complicated, so uh, it, it, it was knotted. So it was knotted, you guys are right. Uh, or at least half of you. And uh, then this is a slightly more complicated one. This has three crossings. Uh, who thinks this is knotted? <laughs> who thinks it's unknotted? Okay, you guys are right, so very good. At least those of you saying it's unknotted, it is. But you see the point, it gets progressively harder and more complicated. So 
Um, this game looks pretty silly. Um, it's, it's almost like child's play, and I, I didn't have to go through very complicated mathematical definitions to introduce uh, the game. Uh, that's, that's part of the reason for, for choosing this, this uh, kind of visual and simple topic. But it's actually very deep. It's, it, it has to do with very deep mathematics, and in particular, I'll mention here uh, just a couple of applications. One of the major unsolved problems in low-dimensional topology is a smooth Poincaré conjecture. So topological version of Poincaré conjecture is well understood and settled. And uh, more delicate versions involve uh, various um, conditions that one can impose on, on um, uh, relations. So, so the Poincaré conjecture is uh, a question whether a manifold that looks like an n-dimensional sphere is actually an n-dimensional sphere. And uh, smooth uh, requires that we work uh, under certain conditions where we can take as many derivatives as we want. So this conjecture is settled uh, in a positive form in low dimensions. It's settled in negative form, so it, it's, we know it fails for sufficiently high dimensional spheres. But dimension four remains very elusive and uh, escapes all uh, methods and approaches that topologists developed over recent years. And um, uh, the question in, in this field boils down to questions which are exactly analogous or close cousins of this uh, knottedness problem that, that, that I mentioned on the previous slide. Part of the reason is that when we think about this knotted and braided structure, uh, in a three-dimensional space, we can think of this three-dimensional space as a boundary of something four-dimensional. And um, that's, that's the basic reason why uh, such knotted diagrams actually represent something or give, get us a uh, in, foot in the door of a four-dimensional topology, that they have something to do with dimension four. So diagrams like this uh, may be sometimes called Kirby diagrams or representing other things, actually do have direct connection to this uh, deep problems in low dimensional topology, but um, they're extremely hard to handle. So it's, it's hard to tell if this diagram has certain properties or if it's knotted, unknotted. And questions like this actually are precisely what stands in the way of resolving this old standing problem, the smooth point correct conjecture. So it's just a question of can we manipulate this diagram and make it uh, decide whether it's knotted or unknotted. I'll, I'll give you more concrete examples later. This one comes from paper of uh, my Friedman and collaborators from about 10 years ago, where uh, being uh, exhausted in, in uh, trying all kinds of theoretical methods uh, that, that uh, mathematicians and theoretical physicists tried, they decided to work with computers. So this uh, title of the paper is Man and Machine, thinking about this long, important problem. Here they used uh, classical computers, in a sense there is no machine learning, no AI, but the need for computers was precisely to help, to aid uh, deciding problems uh, like, like what we're facing here. So there are a couple of other related problems. For instance, there is so-called relative version of one crack conjecture. It's a statement about ball rather than sphere. Namely, the question is uh, whether a manifold which is homeomorphic to four-dimensional ball is also diffeomorphic. If this conjecture is true, it implies uh, the actual smooth point crack conjecture. So many of these interesting statements are closely related. And another cousin here is by looking at a diagram of a knot, you're supposed to tell something similar to this game of unknottedness that I introduced, namely whether it has certain property called ribbon. So that's uh, additional operation uh, that one can uh, introduce that it basically it leads to a certain decision problem, a property very much like knotted, unknotted. Again, they're all close cousins. It doesn't, doesn't really matter, not, not too important. What's important is that the problem we're playing with today uh, is uh, really a part of a network of questions which are important and deep in mathematics. Now, what's stopping us from answering these questions is that typical counterexamples to these conjectures, such as one correct conjecture on the previous slide, or this one called slice ribbon conjecture, involve diagrams which have uh, 30, 40 crossings, and typically actually hundreds of crossings. Whereas theoretical methods that people developed, and there are many invariants and other techniques that, that uh, were developed over the years, can be easily computed only for rather simple knotted diagrams, which uh, usually are limited by 10 or 20 crossings. So for instance, with uh, some of my students and here in the math department, 
Uh, we work on quantum invariants, and the most famous example is probably the Jones polynomial. But these invariants are really uh, hard to compute, also in the terminology of complexity theory. We'll come back to it in a later part of the talk. And uh, there are several uh, challenges here. First is that even the basic pieces of such knotted diagrams grow very fast with number of crossings. So, for example, there are only 165 basic knots uh, which have 10 crossings. But if you move to 16, you suddenly get over a million. And then again, it explodes. And we're talking just about basic, basic pieces. Uh, so that's, that's one part. And um, also computation of these uh, analytical or other methods uh, that, that we have in, in topology also becomes progressively harder. For example, again, John's polynomial and other invariants are computationally hard, also in a technical sense. So for this reason, the wall or limit here is really somewhere around 20 crossings, no, no, no kidding. And there is no hope because even if uh, we believe in Moore's law and technology improves and we get better computers next year, it improves by a factor of two. But this goes faster than exponential. So basically it means that if we can do this year 20 crossings, next year we'll do 21 crossings. So this is, this is the log scale. And what we need, things, interesting examples that we need lie way beyond. So until so far, we really had no way to tackle examples like this. So they were basically approached one by one by experts who can, on a paper, handle these uh, manipulations and see something. And that's extremely difficult. There are basically a couple of experts in the world who could do it. And uh, that's, that's, of course, not a great state of affairs. So we want to approach this no man's land and go even further where we can easily handle, say, hundreds of crossings of, of such diagrams to answer these fundamental questions and fundamental problems. So that's, uh, that's the motivation. By the way, if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any point or raise hands. Now, back to machine learning. It works really well when you have Many configurations, one configuration space is huge, but the space of actions is very small. So that's, that's what works well for games like Go. Chess in that sense is maybe not ideal because there are many different moves you can imagine. But this problem that I mentioned is, is a perfect game because there are many, many knotted diagrams that can be related by only three basic moves. So in this game, there are only three moves we have to input uh, for, for, for machine. And uh, every diagram which can be transformed into another by, by this equivalence relation can be transformed by one of these three moves called Reidemeister moves. So what we're talking is about huge space of possibilities but only three basic moves in the game. So it sounds perfect. It sounds ideal for, for, for the machine. So therefore the question becomes, uh, okay, how, how do we play this game? And of course, in, in machine learning, uh, one of the most important questions in practical sense how, when, when we approach a problem is data representation, how we want to encode um, data. So one way to encode a knot, such a knotted diagram, is just to present computer with a picture. That's, that's uh, one obvious way. It's actually not so bad, but it's also not very good because there is a lot of um, empty space in between of where the crossings happen. And um, if one makes a mistake in a single pixel, that, that, that's probably very bad, especially since we're trying to disentangle this braiding or topological properties. Uh, so it doesn't sound too good. But then there is another way, which is um, much, much better. Uh, encode the data of this knots in terms of so-called braids, which are shown on the left part of the slide. And uh, given every such braiding, on the left, one can produce a node by simply closing the strands in a circular fashion. So this way we reduce question about this uh, knots to a question about braids. So this is the same as braiding of anions that, that I mentioned earlier. And here again, there are only few basic rules. Uh, th this is very simple structure in the sense that uh, I can tell you very quickly what, what it is. These braids are made of a very simple alphabet of sigmas uh, and their inverses, which correspond to braidings doing one type of crossing or another type of crossing in a certain i-th position. So that's, if you want to encode the braid, then we have to basically give collection of such crossings represented by the sigmas uh, and sigma inverses. Very much like Reidemeister moves, uh, equivalences are 
uh, encoded in three basic moves, in this case uh, called braid relations. Basically, if crossings happen far from each other, uh, they completely commute. It doesn't matter in which order we want to present them. If they happen next to each other, there is a non-trivial relation, which is the only non-trivial relation in uh, this structure called Artin braid. So, therefore, if you want to present a knot, uh, instead of just taking a a uh, photo of a bunch of pixels, much better way, for instance, or there are many ways, but one of them is to do it through this uh, language where as letters you use uh, sigmas in various positions, and uh, again, equivalences are contained in, in these basic relations. So notice that I already start using uh, the language letters and words, and indeed, mathematicians, when they talk about the structure, they call elements in this, uh, or sequences of, of, of these uh, sigmas, words in a braid group. So that already resonates with the use of uh, language as in natural language processing and natural language understanding. So we decided uh, with uh, my colleagues, um, uh, Jim Halverson, Fabian Ruel, and Piotr Sukowski, to uh, try to apply these uh, ideas from natural language processing and natural language understanding to the words in a braid group. Because phrased in that way, all we have to decide is whether a given word is trivial or not. So that's, that's uh, for instance, the simple and knotting game that I introduced early on. And now, once it's phrased uh, in terms of uh, language, it's, it sounds that, that this may be a good fit. And again, I emphasize that one of the lessons I, I learned from AI is that uh, probably uh, a lot of time usually should be spent on thinking how to approach a given problem, namely finding um, the right way of encoding the data, data presentation, and choosing the right algorithm, and choosing the right architecture. So this is, these are questions that we'll talk about next in, in trying to solve uh, each given problem. So Piotr is a familiar face uh, on, on this campus. Uh, he was actually postdoc at Caltech, and then uh, visited us uh, many times as a visiting associate. So uh, that's actually how this work was done. Um, about a year or a couple of years ago, uh, when, when he was here before the pandemic, we, we were uh, working together, and that's another reason for me to, to, to speak about this work here. So the goal then is to pitch the machine uh, how to decide whether this uh, thing here is knotted or unknotted. So let's, let's think about this data representation and um, try to decide what is the best algorithm to approach this. Again, we, we shouldn't rush into just uh, doing the coding. We should think about what, what are the available options uh, are there. And um, going back to Terry Vinograd, whom you saw on the first slides, so one of the things that he uh, invented, even before AI uh, techniques became um, very powerful, he suggested that uh, for the future, it would be good to have really delicate, complicated cases of sentences which require machine to really understand the meaning of the sentence really well in order to either process it or parse it or translate it into a different language. So uh, these sentences are now called Vinograd schemas, and, and here are a couple of examples. So one of them is the trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was too big or you can replace the word big with small, and then, of course, yeah, the meaning will change a little bit. So if I ask you uh, what was too big, then we immediately say, well, um, the trophy was too big, that's why it didn't fit. So we quickly have to assign or make connection between the words and the sentence in order to properly process the meaning. And this is important because if you translate this sentence in a different language, the words trophy and suitcase may have different gender. And uh, if in this translation we start making up information, that's, that's of course not good. So that's uh, part of the reason. So these Vinograd schemas were quite challenging for various early AI systems, uh, or for obvious reasons. And uh, going back to the 90s, where I left our discussion of language processing, uh, back at the time, the processing was based uh, more on probabilities. In other words, machines, that's actually what uh, Peter Brown and his uh, team at uh, IBM were, were doing. So uh, their, um, 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 their techniques were, were probabilistic. So this is 
goes under the name of statistical machine translation, where um, the way we actually process information or when we talk to each other, uh, it's interesting that uh, even how it works on biological or psychological level, we're actually guessing what uh, our uh, uh, partner uh, or friend is going to say next, and then when, when uh, the other person speaks, we're actually basically confirming in our head whether this is what we were expecting. So this is very much like such um, machine um, algorithms work. So they consist of two parts, typically. One is uh, called a language model, the other is translation model. So language model generates text, and translation model helps this generating component to confirm with certain probabilities or deny whether um, that the next move is, is a correct one. So again, in statistical uh, translation, uh, machine translation, which was dominating over 90s and early 2000s, this is basically um, how it worked based on probabilities. So machines had to uh, learn these uh, probabilities. And uh, this uh, arrow shows uh, the progress uh, over, over various years as it has slower or smaller derivative. <clears throat> but, um, and, and this scale is a uh, so-called blue scale, which is uh, bilingual evaluation understudy. This is one of the scales typically used uh, to evaluate how machines do on translating from one language to another. Uh, 20 is pretty good, uh, 30 is excellent, and 40 is uh, outstanding, so it's, it's really stellar. So as you can see, they were doing okay, and actually Google Translate in early days uh, used, um, or in early 2000s, used a statistical machine translation like everybody else. But then something happens around uh, 2014, 2015. In 2014, uh, neural machine translation uh, started um, growing very fast, and by 2016, Google Translate already changed its uh, uh, system from statistical to, to neural. So that's, that's where AI comes to the scene, and um, I'll try to give you a hint why, why this happened, what kind of development was involved, and again, if we keep track of the timeline, see we're again approaching this, this uh, mark of roughly 2015. So some of the early, uh, this is actually quite, quite good successful architecture that was used for neural machine translation. It's uh, called sequence to sequence, because if you're given a sentence in one language and your job is to translate it into another language, you can actually mimic what, what I described in words, where when we listen to uh, our conversation partner, we're trying to guess and correct uh, our, our uh, expectations as, as we go. So it's very sequential. So we go through each word in a sequence and, and translate that word. And that's exactly what this architecture is doing. It consists, again, of two parts, which are analogous to the two parts in statistical machine translation that I mentioned a moment ago. So instead of uh, language model and translation model, they are called encoder and decoder. And here um, is, is uh, a realization of this architecture in fairly basic neural nets uh, or layers called recurrent uh, neural nets, RNNs. So each uh, of these nodes corresponds to RNN. It's doing encoding and then uh, meaning vector is passed to uh, the second component and then it does decoding in a similar sequential layer. As uh, so, so those of you who speak German can quickly detect that this is not perfect, so this is an actual example, for instance. The input sentence, uh, sentence is, you asked us to call you back after last Friday, and uh, what comes out is, wir hoffen ja doch, so there is no Friday in, in, in this translation. What it says is that, uh, however, uh, uh, we hope that um, uh, this will help you with uh, your travel plans. So that's, that's roughly the uh, meaning of this sentence. So it's, this is an honest mistake that the machine made based on seeing lots of other chess boards, lots of other examples now in the case of translation. And it did make some connection. Connection is not horrible, but it's not good. And uh, the reason this thing happens, and uh, there are many other examples, that's, for example, now it's harder to see them because, again, machine translation gets better and better. But say five years ago, this was uh, fairly common uh, if you just feed sequence and uh, there, there are some um, se sequence to sequence connections. They, they, that's how they work. And there are several reasons for this. So without going to uh, too technical details, 
uh, it's actually hard for a machine, especially in the sequence to sequence, to keep the um, meaning over broad range of words or letters over a longer part of the text. So long range dependence has become hard in part because we're doing it in sequence. And once you made a step, it's actually hard to go back. So there are so-called so, uh, long short term uh, memory units, which um, were introduced in the late 90s. They help with this problem, but not by much. So another thing is that in machine learning, uh, many neural nets are based on various versions of gradient descent or ascent. And once you have something long, something big and complicated, you're composing activation functions. And these are like sigmoids or relus or other things. And they lead to vanishing gradients. So once you have many layers, uh, they, 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 they lead effectively to, to small gradients. And that becomes hard for a machine. So then there are several other things that, that make it difficult. And the question is, how do we go beyond so we can actually make qualitative progress beyond this example? Well, <clears throat> this um, part of progress came uh, from computer vision also in uh, 2014 and then by 2015 made it to, to machine translation. Uh, it's called attention mechanism. So this is an additional component, an additional uh, type of layer in neural net which keeps track of correlation between a sentence in itself or a sentence in one language and a sentence in another language. So this is basically uh, encoding the context. And that helps a lot with all of these problems that I mentioned a, a moment ago. So its key component is so-called relevance or attention metrics, which is some dot product of uh, um, encoder and decoder uh, information. And uh, it's usually represented either like this in the form of heat map, which uh, tells us which word in one language may be most relevant to the word in another language, or sometimes in a form of uh, self-attention when you, uh, on both scales, you can imagine the same sentence, but then it basically tries to make uh, connections such as in this sentence here, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. So uh, if I ask you uh, who was tired uh, and um, what does word heat refer to, then we see much stronger neural net or weight here uh, connecting it to, to, to animal. Another version of the sentence would be the animal didn't cross the street because it was too wide. And uh, in that case, connection would be between word eat and the street. It's the street which was too wide. So these are typical examples. And such attention layers are extremely good at keeping this, uh, this information. So, here is uh, the next step, uh, the progress. Uh, it's um, a particular architecture of neural net, which is, uh, says that let's throw away everything and keep this attention, uh, attention layer. So uh, the architecture is shown here. It has this uh, attention layer repeated many, many times. And I think the title of the paper speaks for itself. Um, so this became a very popular and much more efficient way of doing translation than, for example, seek-to-seek -seek architecture that I showed you uh, a moment ago. In particular, it did really well with this Winograd schemas. So, uh, for example, the cow A behaved because it was delicious. So again, if we need to translate it to languages like French and German, we really have to understand uh, who was delicious, uh, the cow or the hay, because gender may be different. And you can see that transformer, this um, um, architecture that I showed you is, is, is called transformer based on many attention layers. Uh, it performs pretty well, so it does, uh, so this was Google Translate back at the time in 2017, and the second uh, column is, is this transformer, which uh, does pretty well, so it, it can go through Vinograd schemas uh, quite, quite effectively, it still makes mistakes. So <coughs> it's, um, very multi-purpose uh, type of architecture. It's actually this uh, transformer is good with many, many different tasks. In particular, I mentioned to you that when we do the translation, there are two components. One is generative. It's basically generating text. And you can try uh, this component, for example, by feeding it just one word. So what Lukas Kaiser illustrated in his uh, nice lectures, which I encourage you to, to listen to in 2017, is that if you feed the um, transformer, the word transformer, and asked to generate Wikipedia article, then uh, it produces a very uh, 
believable Wikipedia articles, so sometimes Transformer becomes a book, sometimes it becomes a uh, rock band, as in this example. And um, it's actually quite nice. I mean, it's, uh, it, 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 it has all kinds of details and turns and twists. It, for example, knows that bands dissolve at some point and there is some drama associated to it. So it's actually almost like realistic uh, Wikipedia article, but of course this, this band doesn't exist. Anyway, so we're not done yet. So um, I told you about uh, the 2017 uh, revolution of, of the Transformer. That was a great, um, a great, great um, progress. Then there is this... Huh? Nice. Yeah, what is uh, going to point? Yes, <laughs> so it's it's a famous by now paper by by, by Kitaev, but uh, Nikita Kitaev, indeed. Uh, so th th this is uh, when we were doing this, we were trying uh, with my colleagues. We were trying many different architectures. Like I said, it's important to choose the right way of encoding the data, the right architecture, and find the right algorithm. So in particular, we, we went through many of these, and I'm reviewing for you some, some, some of the prominent examples. And this was basically state of the art back in, in 2020. So it's called Reformer. As the title of the paper says, it's Efficient Transformer. And uh, it optimizes already fantastic machines. So in, in, in the world of uh, neural translation, the transformer was already like a Ferrari. So this does even better, so I don't know what to compare it to. And in particular, what it does is in this <coughs> uh, attention metrics or heat map that I showed you before, it basically tries uh, to pick out the most important uh, pieces. So after transformer appeared, the, there were many developments. For example, uh, this one actually here illustrates so-called variational attention mechanism. And reformer does something similar, basically, by trying to uh, do hashing this uh, sort of tagging to, to most important correlations in that metrics so that we don't have to carry a lot of weight, especially if we have a long chunk of text, but uh, it becomes very, very efficient and faster, uh, reducing the complexity from quadratic size of the metrics to, to something which is linear times the log. So that's, that's quite good. Anyway, so I walked you through some of the developments. Uh, hopefully you see why, why now, and uh, at least from the AI perspective. So let's see what happens when we apply this to our braid words. So now we take this uh, different architectures and try to translate or basically apply to our decision problem whether a knotted diagram is trivial or non-trivial. All we have to show is whether in this funny language it's a trivial word or non-trivial word. And here is what happened. So there are two surprises that, that we didn't expect before we started doing this work. One surprise is that First of all, um, performance improved uh, with a braid length. So if you make more complicated knotted diagram, uh, like I showed you a couple of examples in, in the beginning of the talk, the performance actually improves. So this is, so different colors represent different number of crossings, roughly speaking. And you see that the more crossings, the better accuracy you get. It's always close to 99%, but it actually does better uh, on more complicated knotted diagrams. I don't think we understand fully why this happens. We try to give several reasons in a paper and explore this a little bit, but not fully. And um, one reason perhaps is that just like playing stronger opponent teaches you how to be a better chess player in the same way, uh, trying more complicated knotted diagrams with hundreds of crossings actually teaches neural net how to be a better chess player in this world and, and doing translation. So this was one surprise. So when you have a very complicated knot, I mean, couldn't you learn the same thing from a large number of simpler knots? I mean, does it does it learn on each example knot, or is it just taking one big knot and kind of learning on, on that? No, it learns on. It's important that it learns on many different kinds of knots. So that's a very good question. So you show um, machine thousands, in fact, in practice millions of different knots. Uh, you generate them, so th there are some knots, some are knots, and it should learn how to differentiate them very accurately. And then you save um, some small fraction of that million for, for testing. So th that's this data of testing. So there are many different knots and unknots, and they, it's important that they generate it uh, in different ways, so there are no biases. 
it's a separate analysis of how the statistics is done. And then, uh, yeah, you basically ask uh, to, to, to test. And after you after did the learning part, uh, this is the championship, basically, for Grandmaster. To, uh, we, we did practice at home, so then, then now we come and, and ask it to differentiate the, the test examples, for instance. Does that make sense? That's uh, perhaps. There are a lot of easy cases, or there are some hard cases. Yeah, actually, that's uh, that's another good question. So this uh, this goes into the, the details of uh, braiding and unknottedness. So even before computers got on in a game, so people, human, noticed that they, they couldn't penetrate beyond 20-something crossings. But they noticed that around 20 crossings, there are some very complicated, for some reason, knotted looking diagrams which are actually hard unknots so that you have to increase number of crossings to something like 30 or 40 before you can reduce it back. So uh, such classes uh, in mathematics and pure math are completely not understood. In fact, um, many topologists that probably don't even know about them. And this of course happens here a lot. So the landscape of knots is very non-homogeneous for some reason. So your question is basically about that and that's, that's another thing you can now try to probe with the machine. So indeed it learns very different strategies, which is, again, if it can learn how to play game of chess, it's not too surprising because in game of chess there are so many different combinations and openings and we have to learn all of them to play it really well with a success rate of 99%. So yeah, there are some easy ones and there are some really hard ones. And it has to know, it has to be an expert in everything. So that's why it's important to choose the right algorithm, the right uh, architecture to, to so that was one surprise, and indeed I completely agree that it is uh, surprising, at least somewhat. But uh, another surprise was that I walked you through five different architectures of this machine translation uh, techniques, and uh, they are not needed. Even the most basic neural net called a feed-forward neural network, it forms just as well. Maybe a, a little worse than what I showed you here, this fancy reformer, but it does pretty well. Too. So what we learn here is that this unknotting problem is actually easy for a machine. So what does it mean? Well, how about we look into complexity of this problem, and actually it has been looked at. So um, back in uh, 2008, the, this paper proves that uh, the problem that we're trying to approach is a problem of NP type. It's in a complexity class NP, which means that uh, non-deterministic uh, polynomial time, so uh, Problems in this class are very much like Sudoku puzzles. They may be hard to solve. They may not have polynomial type algor time algorithms, but you can verify correct solution in a polynomial time. So then there is, uh, in the zoo of complexity classes, there is another complexity class called coin P, which is analog where you can verify negative answers in polynomial time. And of course, we don't know um, how this uh, Venn diagram or zoo of complexity classes is arranged because part of it is, for instance, this clay problem of whether P equals NP. I think most experts believe uh, that, that it's not. Um, in particular, we don't know if uh, NP and coin P also coincide. Probably not because, well, if, if, if they don't, then also NP does not equal P. So the clay problem also has a negative answer. So here I'm drawing this Venn diagram with several assumptions. Uh, which are, I guess, most plausible to, to, to most people. So, in particular, um, here in, in this paper, Greg Kuberberg showed that assuming generalized Freeman hypothesis, this problem that we're, the game we're trying to play is also in a complexity class coin P. So it means that negative solutions are also can be verified in polynomial time. And it's actually interesting because many problems that happen to be both in NP and coin P over time were found to be polynomial type problems. So in other words, they actually belong to P. So there might be a polynomial type algorithm. And you can interpret what I showed you before, that the fact that this is easy problem for computer, that maybe actually there is a polynomial time. And we don't know it as, as human, but maybe that's what machines learn very quickly, that there is a simply algorithm to play this game. Well, I have to point out that some problems that happen to be at the intersection of NP and coin P 
um, are actually hard. For example, deciding whether an integer is a product of two primes has this property and is believed to be a hard problem. So maybe we shouldn't celebrate too early. And let's, let's look a little bit more closely. So uh, a few years after, um, there was another paper on, on the subject which approved the same result uh, relaxing this generalized Riemann hypothesis assumption. So it also showed that this problem that we're discussing is in both NP and coin P. And uh, here there is this uh, amusing corollary which says that if it's NP complete, that NP equals coin P. Like I say, we don't know if these two classes coincide. Generally, they are believed not to be the same. And if that's the case, then again, clay problem also has a negative answer, namely that P does not equal NP. So the title of this paper speaks loud and clear. Like I said, we shouldn't celebrate too early declaring that this seems like an easy problem because if you impose any constraint, for example, that machine has to learn whether it's not or are not with imposing upper limit, for example, of number of moves, it immediately becomes NP hard. So that's, therefore, it's, it's actually probably at the upper range of, of, of complexity in this NP and coin P and may not be at all on polynomial. So finally, I want to mention that I already mentioned earlier that uh, traditional approaches in mathematics to, to these sort of problems uh, involve various invariants, which is another component in my life. And uh, again, the students maybe devise new invariants and so on. And I already mentioned that they're extremely hard to compute. So uh, this is a typical um, version of such invariant, or in fact, a question that from which you can produce many different invariants. And uh, here it's being shown that it's in a fairly esoteric uh, complexity class, parsimoniously sharp P complete. This is uh, a class uh, which is pretty hard, and it's uh, instead of yes or no type questions, it's asking about how many solutions you have, for example, many graph problems uh, about perfect matchings or colorings turn out to be in, in, in this complexity class. So, this uh, development from the complexity theory point of view shows that the problem we're trying to attack uh, may be simple, we don't know, but it also may be very complicated. So that, that, that's, uh, there is no uh, <coughs> clear, clear message here yet. Uh, so in the remaining couple of minutes, I want to show you a different type of AI uh, approach. So previously we were trying to play this game so that machine can predict, uh, basically focus on a decision problem, yes or no. And it does it pretty well, so the graphs with 99% accuracy were showing that. But you can also ask machine to actually play the game of chess, namely to, to perform the moves, to, to show us not only yes or no, but how to reduce it to trivial diagram or answer this problem um, and actually produce uh, various moves. So there are, again, different algorithms to do it. So one simple is just try to do random things. And again, if computer is fast enough, for example, Deep Blue was able to perform two, uh, 200 million uh, operations or chess boards per second. So then, then it can probably find some solution just by trying things at random. So uh, this is the random walker. Uh, it's RW and it's a green uh, set of dots. This is a diagram of accuracy versus complexity, uh, how many crossings you have. And as you can see, it quickly goes down. So that, that's not very good. So then uh, there are various other algorithms. For example, there is this A3C. This is uh, a synchronous advantage uh, actor critic algorithm. It does pretty well, but it also goes down. And then there is a blue one, which is an algorithm called trust region policy optimization, which does really well. So you can see that uh, just as before, for whatever reason, uh, this likes to play this game. In other words, you give it more complicated opponent and it perform, performs pretty well. So accuracy goes up as a complexity or number of crossings also increases. So what is this algorithm? Uh, again, in machine learning, uh, most basic uh, architectures and layers are based on various versions of gradient descent or gradient ascent, as this uh, left picture illustrates. We want to go up, so we basically try to um, find some function, and according to this function, we, we try to perform this gradient ascent or descent. So the danger of this is that if landscape of configurations or possibilities is uh, not very smooth or even, you may perform a step in the right direction, but then if step is too big, you may fall and never recover. So that's, that's pretty bad. 
So instead, this trust region policy optimization does the following. It draws a region around a given state and then optimizes within that region. So that way you guarantee to never uh, perform such a, such a dangerous fall of the cliff and you improve gradually and steadily, but it's a constant improvement. So that's this uh, TRPO algorithm, that's, that's the basic idea. And here is another graph of how many actions does this algorithm perform on various knots and braids of different uh, number of crossings. You can see the same message that as braid length uh, increases, so if you have more and more crossings, then actually it's number of operations that it performs to reduce it to uh, trivial braid, in case if it's possible, uh, stays more or less constant. So, or it grows here in a little bit, you can see, but that's of course expected because if you have more sites, then, then of course you should have more operations, but they're exactly the same order of magnitude, roughly speaking, whereas these other two uh, guys go, go, go way up. So the message uh, for me from all of this was that uh, it's a lot of fun and you can connect completely different problems and completely different fields by, by digging far enough, for instance, uh, trying to understand how machines can translate text from one language to another language or parse text happen to be perfectly suited for questions uh, such as uh, there's not a problems which uh, have deep connections to topology, point correct conjecture and various other conjectures that we simply could not access until recently by any traditional means. So this was, uh, this was really, really hard. And I don't want to um, advertise this, that machines, of course, can, can do this much better than us. It's, it's important, and hopefully this talk was also illustrating the point that uh, we, are, as humans, are needed to do a lot of thinking. So I actually learned by, by working on, in this field that compared to, say, research in theoretical physics, dynamics here of a project is a bit different in the sense that uh, you spend a fair part of the time, maybe more than 50 or even 70% even thinking about how to approach the problem in the right way, namely all these questions about choosing the right way of encoding the data, data representation, choosing the right algorithm and then choosing the right architecture are essential to uh, doing it in the right way and uh, increasing the, improving the performance in the end. So um, in that sense, computers won't replace us, but it's a lot of fun to, uh, to cross these bridges between different domains. So thank you for your attention. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. That's, that's actually a very non-trivial question. I think it's uh, also part of uh, cutting-edge research. So this paper actually talks about it and shows that if you have quantum computer, you're not going to improve on this uh, parsimoniously sharp beat, com sharp beat complete, unfortunately. But um, you may improve, uh, of course, computations of some things which involve grading. So after all, that's one of the ways uh, of making quantum computer, and perhaps not too surprisingly, but it still requires certain steps to show that they will improve uh, computational power of things like John's polynomial, for example. So it's again, sits kind of at a borderline, so definitely quantum computers will help, but how much, it's, it's actually not clear. So very much like, uh, as, as in this last part of the talk devoted to complexity, it sits kind of in the middle where it becomes interesting. So it's hard to make bets or opinions. It's so, some evidence is for, some is against. So I, I would say the same, same thing. So they will, quantum computers will definitely help, but uh, I don't know if any of the problems that I mentioned will be solved in this way. So. Certainly it will be improved, that's for sure. Uh, you say that the number of objects is even more 
I wonder whether it is actually true again that if you, if you just you know, like when we get this problem into the unknown problem. Um, that's that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure I know exactly the, the, the problem you're referring to, but uh, maybe we can start after. Uh, so that, that would be good if there are connections. Yeah. I, I don't know. That's a very good question. Do you have the people who have these odd ones trying to learn other generics uh, using kind of machine learning? Uh, yes, yes, they, they, they have. So I, I probably should have said in the very beginning when I was giving this, this introductory remarks that five years ago when we started doing this, uh, this was completely uncharted territory more or less, uh, trying to, to, to bridge this very abstract mathematical questions with, with machine learning, and many colleagues would be reasonably skeptical. So over the past five years, a lot has happened, and uh, now I feel comfortable giving this talk. I wouldn't be comfortable giving this talk five years ago, because again, even perception in, in mathematical or physical community was very, very different. So indeed, uh, th this is now a fast growing, exploding field, and uh, some groups are uh, specifically looking for invariance in this way. In other words, that's a very close cousin of, of the problem we were discussing, where, for instance, uh, if a knot happens to be um, a trivial knot, uh, or a machine can disentangle it, uh, one can ask why, and then uh, try to extract from neural nets some information that we as human didn't notice, that there might be some new invariants or some new um, clues uh, why, why, why this happens. So this way, uh, again, it's an uh, ongoing process, but there are quite a few groups which are exploring uh, new invariants in this way. It's, it's a close cousin of this question. Can you give some idea about how this machine learning approach compares to, let's say, any other classical algorithm, classical in the sense of non-machine learning algorithm? Um, right, so the, perhaps more, most relevant in the context of, of, of this talk is uh, the, this, the slide I showed earlier on um, man and machine, a uh, famous paper by Mike Friedman and collaborators. So they, they try to uh, use what indeed I call classical computer in a sense. It's a completed uh, algorithmic, uh, traditional approach of computing invariance. And what happened here is that they, they had this uh, two examples in the paper. The whole paper and the whole project, which took quite a lot of time, was devoted essentially to two examples. One had 78 crossings, the other had 86 crossings. And uh, they, in the paper, it's fun to read, they describe how many hours of supercomputers they spent trying to uh, crack uh, these two examples plus one more, which they managed to solve, it had very small number of crossings, maybe 20 or something. And, and this they didn't, so they, 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 they didn't know. So they tried to compute various invariants, run out of memory and speed, and some of the invariants they were able to compute, some were not, so it was an open question. Uh, luckily or unluckily, uh, uh, basically within a week after the paper appeared, uh, so somebody managed to actually solve this problem and completely resolve it. So these are not potential counterexamples to, to SPC4 anymore. But uh, this still is. So this was also published 10 years ago, even though it has a smaller number of crossings. The, 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 this is not known. So uh, this gives an idea of dynamics uh, in, in such classical algorithmical calculations. It's pretty hard. And... Um, Basically, you, you manage, uh, you, you work on one example for many, many months with many uh, resources of supercomputers. Whereas uh, AI simply outperforms any of this, uh, I, I would say. So uh, again, if you think about how to approach the problem in the right way, that's where most time goes. Um, you can, with 100% probability, uh, say that certain knot is knotted or unknotted by just presenting the actual moves. And this can now become a mathematical theorem, so there is nothing probabilistic about it anymore. And machine can handle it on a simple laptop. So I have here uh, um, codes that can run maybe sometimes for hours, but we're talking about hours, not many months. And then we're doing many knots in these hours rather than just uh, one. So it's, uh, that's, that's roughly measure of performance. Um, 
practical applications. Um, not that I know of immediately, so it's, uh, for me, I come over on a very kind of mathematical side of the spectrum, perhaps, especially for, for most uh, colloquium speakers here. Um, so my, my interest is, is uh, purely theoretical, I would say. Uh, these problems are uh, somewhat related to um, various problems in cryptography, so various variations and close cousins of them may, may have applications of this nature. And that's the best I know. Uh, I think that's a very good question. That's something that should be considered. Uh, we didn't because uh, we, we did a little bit and then moved on to other things. So now we're trying to approach, uh, we, we're still working on related problems, mostly trying to crack this example, for instance, and its various close cousins. So that, that involves not exactly the problem I described today, but, but this, this other variant. Um, but uh, what you're suggesting or asking is an extremely good question. It definitely should be, and it's closely related to the other question about learning invariants. And uh, machine, of course, uh, learns something. So the question is, what, what, what exactly is that something? It's most likely going to be super valuable information. Uh, we didn't invest time and effort, but only because our time is limited. Uh, I think that would be a great project to, to dig deeper into. So let's thank the speaker again.